everyone and welcome to the panel uh, which focuses on AI in, and disruption in marketing. Uh, it's a tough slot right after lunch. I'm hoping that the conversation is interesting and engaging enough to keep all of you awake. So uh, I'm just going to open out the floor. Uh, we have a very eminent panel and also a very interesting panel, like I was telling them, because we have representation from both the brand as well as the agency. So uh, a lot of interesting perspectives, insights, and experiences is what we are hoping to uh, you know, have today. I'm going to open out the floor by uh, asking each of you to uh, you know, tell us how you have been integrating and leveraging AI in your respective marketing efforts in your respective industries. So let's start with you, Bajesh. Hi, everyone. So uh, we are a performance marketing agency. And uh, for us, AI has been a part of our life, I would say, for the last seven to eight years not just for the last two, three years where people have just started talking about AI because when it comes to automation, when it comes to uh, creation, everything has been happening through AI. Uh, and the Googles and the metas of the world like to spend money, learn from others' money, and then say this is working, this is not working. So uh, that's one part. And uh, it's been like two years now where we started using a lot of AI in even creatives because what we see and have figured out is that unlike the old media where it's a one to many conversation in new media especially digital you can actually have a one to one conversation with a consumer so creative also has become a very important part we use that to personalize communication rather than having a very generic communication, uh, which helps uh, for brands to get better ROI for the same amount spent. So that's the way we at our end use AI. We, I can pass the mic to you. Yeah, I think when AI first came, right, uh, you tend to think of these things as these things will solve for everything in the world. Uh, and uh, it traditionally isn't so. So I think we broke it down into saying that there are three things we should think of. What can we do faster? What can we do better? And what can we do now do that we couldn't do earlier? So everyone knows about the faster part, right? You can, if you were writing 10 articles, you can write 100. If you were making two videos, now you can make 10. So that was the first part of it. The second was what can we do better? Uh, what was better was can you, as you know, we just mentioned, can you do better targeting? Uh, can you uh, get across the right message uh, to the right person at the right time? The holy grail of N is equal to one marketing, right? Can you, is this a step in that direction? But I think while we finished those, I think in three or four months, what we've really tried to do is what can we now do that we could not do earlier? So I think automation before AI was a lot about, you know, all the automation that we've done in the world is all about event-based automation. Uh, and insights was where uh, you had to put in a lot more effort. Uh, so one of the things we are trying to build a lot on is, can we have insights-based automation now, if you only had event-based automation? So I think what, what we're really excited about at this point is, we've covered what we can do faster, what we can do better, what else can we do that could not have been done before this world, even with thousands of people and thousands of machines. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, check. I'm audible? I'm audible? Fantastic. Okay, super. So. Um, I think, uh, so the, the trouble for most creative agencies <coughs> is that we're not um, incentivized to do things that reduce the time that we spend on a project because uh, for, a, for a very long time, most creative agencies and most big creative agencies today still charge by time, right? So where is your incentive in the first place to be more efficient, to introduce automation, to you know essentially do things in a faster, better, kind of way, that's not how we cost, right? Or And so in, um, I think in, in my previous job, which was with a legacy creative agency until, uh, until 2021, while there was a lot of learning and knowledge, um, um, I used to uh, head creative for Web Chutney. And so 
being a digital creative agency itself puts you in that place where there's a lot of learning and knowledge. But applying that and actually introducing it into your workflow is not something that you can very easily do when that's not how you're charging the client, right? <laughs> so uh, in the last couple of years, we've completely changed that model. We no longer charge by our time. We charge by the outcome and the output and the value that you get out of it, et cetera. So now we have the incentive. Uh, and now we're able to think with a very free mind on how can this actually help, first of all, us in our own internal workflows, because <clears throat> another, <clears throat> sorry, another mistake a lot of creative agencies make is um, recommending solutions to their brands while with tons of skeletons in their own closet, right? So we gotta fix our house first and essentially make sure that all of us in the room have enough personal experience interacting with the technology as much as possible before we go and parrot it elsewhere. And um, that's something that's been very, very actively happening. I'll tell you from a supremely simple thing like building our own customized leave tracker, okay, which is, which is, which is now being done through a separate model, to going ahead and uh, Oh, obviously, right from storyboarding to, to trying to create better scripts to better project workflow, all of that, um, better comp analysis, that entire par part of, of, or of arriving at, let's say, a campaign idea or a solution, to consumer-facing AI, which, uh, which we've done for our clients in, in the work, right? And, and I'm told some of our work has already been featured today, so I'll, 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 I'll skip those parts. but starting at home and then approaching it uh, outward has been supremely productive uh, which is which is a luxury i know that most creative agencies don't get to have because of the way that they're costed nice nice uh, you know it's strange when you get a bunch of uh, marketers in the room uh, they tend to solve the problems that uh, they've always tried to solve because that's the way in which things have worked for many many years right and that's what we're trained to do uh, and in moments of disruption, that doesn't necessarily serve serve the purpose. Uh, and we, I was at a conference about a, a month and a half ago where you had AI experts who were not from the commercial or marketing world who were trying to solve problems like uh, diabetes or cancer research or large language processing models. Um, there is very interestingly, for example, a coal mine in the Arctic, uh, uh, which is not, uh, I mean, it's, it's a decommissioned coal mine where they're trying to preserve the heritage of uh, things like Ajanta paintings using AI in those kind of spaces. And as soon as you, you get uh, people from a specific domain like marketing into a room, we begin to start thinking, how can we optimize our PPC campaigns and sell more soap or sell more flights with, uh, with AI? So I think one of the first things that we did when, when uh, AI became the new buzzword, when we weren't sure you know, how, uh, how disruptive it would be uh, by nature is to look at the industry that we were in and, and whether there was an existential threat to uh, travel as a concept. Because one of the first things that you realize if you look back at, at May of 2020 when the pandemic hit, two months into the pandemic uh, when everybody moved on to online and there was a lockdown across uh, the country, uh, the valuation of Zoom as a company was larger than the top seven airlines in the world. Now, over time, obviously, that's reversed and things have normalized. But what it does is give you a sense of the expectation of disruption that is there in people's minds where they think that something like travel is very replaceable with technology. Uh, and so what we first did, I think, is to recognize that if we continue to define ourselves as being in the business of transporting people from A to B, then we're prone to disruption from any kind of, whether it's you know better virtual conferencing or AI, etc., uh, but if you define yourselves as somebody who's in the business of creating experiences and memories, which is what travel has always been about, meeting new people, cultures, communities, interacting in a physical manner that cannot be replaced by technology, uh, and you focus on the non-hygiene factors, which most of, unfortunately, Indian aviation has been, whether it's on-time performance or safety or th things which you should actually take for granted, and instead focus on the experience of the warmth of the service, uh, which is not replaceable by technology, or a hot meal which you can't, uh, you know, taste outside those uh, places, then you begin to really redefine uh, what your experience stands for. And that's, obviously, we've done the usual, I mean, AI-powered chatbots, pricing algorithms using AI, etc. But I think the core focus for us was to really look at, is this going to be an existential threat to us? And if it is, what do we do to make sure that our business is, uh, is doing that is not going to be disrupted by, by something that we thought is going to be a long-term disruption. Okay. So 
So are you saying that in your industry, AI doesn't have a very, very significant role to play? It I mean, it does, but it always has. If you look at revenue management algorithms, I mean, probably one of the few industries which does pricing at an individual personalization basis. Most people are, are um, personalizing content or personalizing uh, creative or personalizing messaging. Uh, for many years, the aviation industry has personalized uh, even things like yes. pricing, right? A lot of that pricing has been based on uh, very base uh, kind of models of looking at, uh, you know, what the demand is, number of days out, etc., and not really personalized to an individual level. But with the right amount of first-party data that you're able to accumulate, even if you start with cohorts, uh, and not just for the pricing of the airline, but also the pricing of ancillaries. Like if you uh, recognize one of the insights that we got when we started looking at the data was that female solo travelers have a higher propensity to pick a window or a middle seat, but they do it at cheaper prices than male solo travelers. So they don't want to sit in the middle, but they will still pick a seat that is towards the back of the plane because they don't, there is some element of guilt at paying a premium price for a front row seat, right? Uh, when we did pricing algorithms then to say, can we reprice it to be a discounted price of a 50% or can we make, for example, children, people who are flying with children, can we make the children seat free? Then we realized the overall family tends to spend a lot more uh, because the child seat is free and obviously if the child is going to be sitting somewhere and you'll pick a seat for the child where they can sit, uh, you're going to be sitting next to that child, right? So the accumulative share of wallet that you're going to get is only going to increase, but you're going to also be left with somebody who's felt good about the entire experience that they've had. Uh, obviously, in terms of personalization of, of communication, content, chatbots, etc., it's there, but it's the nature in which you kind of use that, uh, that first party data with large algorithms that begins to define how you're, how you're changing your business model and not just the manner and the medium in which you're communicating. Right, absolutely. So on the topic of personalization, right, because all of you have touched upon that, it comes with its own set of challenges. Uh, so there are ethical considerations. Uh, there's also the matter of uh, whether the brand has been represented consistently, you know, and is there a trade-off between personalization and brand identity being consistent? What are your views on that? Have you all faced these challenges and how do you mitigate them? Of course, yes, certainly from sometimes brand guidelines, we have faced these challenges, but uh, what we have seen outcome study, personalization over privacy, people actually click more when the creative is personalized. Because see, it happens to us also, right? If I'm in the process of buying a car, suddenly I feel the entire city has holdings of cars. That holdings have always been there, but I've started observing it now because I'm in that whole cycle of buying a car or buying a two-wheel or buying a house, right? Same thing happens on digital. When I'm in the process of buying something, you know, because what is happening is there are so many signals now. I mean, we are an open book, right? We all play Candy Crush and give every data possible to the companies who are targeting and then the data get passed on. So, you know, I think the, the best case study was when a husband and wife were fighting and the phone could hear it and they started seeing ads of divorce lawyers everywhere. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's personalization, but that's Phone's working. listening to you. <laughs> yeah, the phone is always listening to, uh, and if you have Android, then you're sorted, your life is sorted, right? So, <laughs> so, uh, so that, but that helps. Um, and in fact, uh, a very funny thing, some, some of my friends are not from the industry and when, when I tell them who are my clients, tu ye? Wherever I go, I see the ads everywhere. I said, that's remarketing. Don't worry. It's like, you know, so like that day I put this in the cart and it's everywhere now, everywhere now, wherever I go, it is there. But then they only give a feedback, but it works because, you know, it just reminds me that I was, I was looking for this and I'm purchasing it. So I think there are pros and cons, but if you actually handle it well uh, and don't play much with brand guidelines, don't try to be over enthusiastic, introduce porn industry in personalization, introduce other things. If you just go uh, the, for, I would say the templated way, I think it works. And Gee, it gives what better your, results. Yeah, what are your thoughts yeah, on this? So I'll, I'll, I'll slightly, no pun intended, but I'll yes. divorce the question, the two parts of the question. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so just on brand guidelines in particular, right, and slightly long answer, I guess, but um, we remember when about, let's say, 10 years ago, 
the concept of user generated content like properly saw its you know it was birthed right and um, i think every brand out there especially bigger brands were very worried about how is my brand going to be seen when a user is allowed to create whatever she or he wants out of it and that first the so every brand's pain threshold so to speak had to increase a little bit if they had to embrace the idea of user generated content right and be like okay cool i don't need to be just be shown in this pristine way cool you're not using the red that i have in my palette that's perfectly fine and so on and we've all gotten slightly used to this idea that cool as long as users are creating content i'm fine okay now i think it's the second version of that where the pain threshold has to get even higher because it is now entirely possible for any user anywhere to put your brand in the context of absolutely random things and for that to exist on the internet right so tomorrow if i if i want to go and create an image so funnily enough right so we've seen um, how many of us are familiar with grok which is twitter's ai fantastic and we're familiar with gemini which is google's ai right uh, we're familiar with the the kind of almost uh extremely different ways in which gemini and grok said which was okay which was not okay what they would be okay creating an image of versus not gemini was was trolled on the internet for a lot for being uh too too hyper woke and too um, uh, you know just just going extreme on the kind of things that they wouldn't depict for instance if you were to ask gemini can you show me a picture of a pope you wouldn't get a white person they would only show people from different races because gemini had that affirmative action saying okay cool i want to show people of different races different ethnicities whenever you're asking me for a prompt so even if you don't mention it unless you specifically ask me to show a person of a particular race i will i'll i'll deliberately go ahead and make that person a little more diverse which on the face of it felt like a good thing to do right um and which also meant that they would not show you particular types of content uh or particular images grok on the other hand is a complete free for all in fact the joke about grok is grok is wild grok doesn't care grok will just you type in whatever you want and grok will <laughs> will will create an image so if any of you all have seen the re recent reels of the videos of uh, uh kamala harris and donald trump deep fake but they're all they're both walking on the beach like they're a happy couple that's grok okay and the fact that that it was okay for grok to create that it didn't have a problem now imagine in in this in a similar vein whichever your brand is if one of you all are in the uh, in quick commerce or an e-commerce category it's very possible to now create an ai generated image of someone receiving an ek47 as in in their home delivery <laughs> from from a zepto or a blinkit or whatever it's perfectly fine so you'll have that zepto branding and someone will pull one huge gun out of it this image can be created by a user as of today okay now where is your pain how much further does that pain threshold have to increase if we were to say okay cool my brand can be seen i mean someone can generate that what am i going to do about it am i going to go ahead and keep suing different users there's another internet joke about how nintendo keeps suing its users for for the, for, for for things like this so um i feel when it comes to brand guidelines overall in the next half a decade if this keeps going where it's going we're going to forget how seriously we take brand guidelines today in the same way where we, if we if we feel like we have started taking it a little less seriously since ugc happened that's going to increase even further after this you're right uh, what are your views on this i agree on the brand guidelines part i think they're definitely <laughs> <laughs> they're definitely becoming more fluid um, and we're realizing that keeping them locked in a box is not helping the brand uh, and i think people are more willing to see you in any way possible right uh, they're willing to see you in their own light but to personalization right i think i think see there is the tendency for the marketer to go overboard and say i'll show my skills on personalization it doesn't it becomes an art that i will you know and i think that's where things start to go a little off uh, you know you need to communicate a message you need to communicate in a message that means that for example at resupe we target a lot of small businesses right we need to say we understand your business and we are building the right products for your business and we understand you like that's what personalization is supposed to do right that it's not made for everyone it's made for you and but if you then go overboard and say this is 
why we say it is built for you, we know 10 things about you. So there's a tendency to take personalization overboard. Uh, and I think it's important to know where to stop. Uh, to know that I have to get my message across, I have to tell my customer, whoever is, it is, that you know I understand you, I, I know you have a problem, I have a solution for you. Uh, whatever that problem is, right? And if you, have, if you have it backed by a great insight, that's what good marketing is. Now if you tend to take that overboard and say that, uh, you know, I will put four algorithms more on top of it to make it down to the last person and I will be able to identify what their favorite product is uh, three months back uh, and communicate that to them. At what point in time does the consumer think, why do you know this? And uh, especially in my category where we're dealing with a lot of businesses, we have a lot of smart people on the other side who are, you know, consumers themselves. And so, you know, at, at some point in time, consumers start saying, you don't need to know this about me. You know, I, I respect what you're doing, but you're going overboard. I think that's what a lot of people feel when there's over-personalization. So I think it's uh, good to have a level to which you say this is efficient, this works, this gets my point across, but beyond that it becomes, you know, uh, something else. Right. So uh, the other problem that we have, right, with uh, with this is also the, uh, with the personalization is the ethical considerations, right, which comes with customer data management. How do we tackle this? So Spotify wrapped as a concept is, I mean, I think it's genius because they've turned, <laughs> they're basically like, they're like, we have so much of your data, but we're going to make you love it that we have so much of your data. <laughs> Netflix right, too, right? For that matter. Yeah, yeah. Because because they, they they give it out to you in this beautiful. Oh, here's what you listen to. You know, you listen to this and this, and then you love it. You're like, hey, I love it that you know so much about me, right? So I think I mean there is so much psychology at play over here about what users actually end up being comfortable with in terms of like overall how you use use their data. Um, I don't think users overall have a problem with their data being used, but the context in which is being used and and and. The softer aspects of that is where the make or break happens, which is what makes it so much more difficult, right? Because um, most of us in leadership, uh, if we're able to, we can set the big picture agenda. But where a, a point like this fails is exactly in that last mile about how you make a person feel at that point when you're, when you're asking whatever you're asking of them or when you show them, this is, I've taken all your data and here's what I've Kind of done so I think it, it so. depends upon how it is pitched or presented to the consumer, right? If it's going to benefit them in some way, which is what is happening with Spotify and the OTT platforms, uh, then it's not so bad. But is this the case across industries? For so instance, just, how just does it work? to what he said, right? I think the most important part is that you don't use any PII. So for example, if I show you an ad on Meta, hi PG, then you're scared. Because how did he come to know my name? How did he get this? Right, you know, this right. is not happening. But as far as, you know, you're using softer angles of it, like, you know, the, mis the music I'm listening to, like in the airline industry, what we do is that we know somebody has booked a ticket from Bombay to Bangalore. So if you, if you just show him an ad that web check in your Bombay Bangalore flight, they don't have a problem. But as far as you tell them that, you know, we know you're flying at 135 flight, we know this is happening with you, that I think is a problem. So when I meant personalization, I meant more on the lines of softer sites, not like, hi Dushant. And I know I just scared the hell out of you where, how does he know my date of birth? How does he know my PAN card number? You know, not that. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it is important uh, where if, if you're in that flow without using PII, I don't think consumers have any problem. I think people love Spotify, they love Netflix. They know now, it's a 99% match of what I watch. They end up watching that movie. You know, we, we all know our data is getting used there. I mean, all consumers know, uh, those who are. But as far as there is no PII, they're fine. You know? Siddharth? I, I tend to agree, but I, I also think that it depends on the nature of the data that you're sharing. When you're sharing with, with a Spotify or a Netflix, it's your consumption of content. You're more comfortable sharing that because you know that they will personalize the content that they're giving back to you. There are a large number of us, whether it's, I mean, for example, um, uh, payment gateway, right? Uh, I'd be much happier to share my data with the Razor Pay. Uh, and I think that most people are agnostic right now. They're not aware of where they're making payments, right? Uh, going forward, if you go back to the genesis of what a brand is, it's about a relationship of trust that you're going to have. 
for a very long time we've been agnostic and commoditized most of our various different industries and now with this level of personalization of data with the extent of data that we're sharing i mean again i take the same example during the pandemic health and contact declaration for wherever you were going your mobile phone number now is sort of a given and you walk into any uh, pub or restaurant in bangalore the first thing they do is ask you for your mobile number and you happily give it and you have no idea where where it's going right uh, and maybe to some extent uh, being in india we're more comfortable sharing our uh, data for whatever reason uh, that consciousness i think will come as soon as we start realizing what most of these organizations uh, and individuals are doing with our data uh, and over a period of time what that will mean is you will only begin to trade your data with brands and organizations that you trust uh, and that differential of what a brand stands for is then going to become a lot more important where i believe for example today where most people are agnostic to which pg they are going through uh, tomorrow a powered by razorpay is going to make a lot more impact because you suddenly say hey, i am willing to share my credit card data my tokenization data my personalization data with these brands or for example with uh, even i mean you take the airline example uh, with either an intermediary which is an online travel agent which is a trusted brand or directly with the airline website and we're already seeing those trends increasingly happen you're not as comfortable sharing your address details or your health details or you know where all you've traveled to your passport information uh, your friends and family details we get a lot more friends and family details on our direct website than you would give to an intermediary because i know i trust that brand with the data that that we're giving them and that will become the differentiator not just in terms of who you transact with Uh, but how you transact with them and how you continue to engage with them because once i've given my data to a brand that i trust instead of going to another brand the next time and giving my data again i'd prefer to go back to that same brand and reduce the number of touch points and and individuals who i'm sharing that that data with and that will become an increasing differentiator in 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 who you do business with i agree so it goes back to the brand that you're interacting with and what is your relationship with the brand in the past right your history with the brand uh another thing that i would wanted to touch upon is there's been a lot of debate about uh, ai versus creativity right the human versus ai what are your thoughts on that can i just add to something is it excellent point uh, right before this uh, this question um it also like if we if if by what you're saying um how much a consumer is willing to share data with you becomes a proxy for how much they trust you essentially right so that's that's a lovely takeaway for brands to ask yourself how high are my trust scores before i ask someone for their fpd data or i mean my year one or year two of this brand itself am i going for consumer data as this big thing without establishing all of the trust scores that that i need and yeah that's a wonderful point um so your other question was on um, my question was on uh, ai versus creativity okay. right so, does anyone else yeah. want to say uh, anyone so for me i think the simple answer is vasikaran versus robo right you mean to say the whole rajnikanth philosophy and it clearly said that robo doesn't work right as uh, doesn't have feelings uh, i think it's we can use ai to build efficiencies but not be completely dependent on the ai ki wo ai ne che creative bana ke diye chada do i'm sorry you know there has to be a human angle to it there has to be feelings in it you know uh, and i think that's my view i don't think it can be i don't think there's a day going to come one brand will say just uh, tell meta ai to make 60 creatives and upload it on my campaign it's uh, you know the the great part uh, this ai thing is been there in google adwords i think since i would say 15 16 years even in the us smbs don't use it forget about india india mein to labor hai na matlab affordable hai right but even in the us they don't uh, they do pick up a part of it then use a illustrator try to edit it in their own format in their own way and then upload it so i think yeah ai will help it will help us build efficiencies it will help us uh, give that first idea you know sometimes you just type on ai if you want to write a blog and then you edit it in your tonality because what also happens is brand guidelines thoda to respect karna padta hai na matlab because every brand has their own tone they want to speak to people ai doesn't have that feelings uh, ai can just write a quirky email if you want but how quirky you want to be you have to rewrite it right so i always feel that it's uh, it's it's wasikaran it's not robo 
<laughs> so going back to your point, because you brought up brand guidelines a couple of times. Because yeah. uh, I love it. <laughs> I yeah. can see that. <laughs> <laughs> so on the previous point around personalization, right? And um, when you were saying that sometimes we tend to overdo the entire personalization bit, what happens when you have different cohorts? I'm sorry, I'm going back to the question because the thought just struck me. What happens when you have different distinct cohorts, right? And uh, you bring in personalization, and how do you then have a consistent brand voice? Does it impact the brand voice? Does it impact the brand personality? I'll combine both, right? So this AI versus people and the personalization thing. So there's this particular business cohort that we find that doesn't transact from Friday to Sunday. So we decide that we have to figure out a way to get them to start transacting. Then we realize they're from a particular industry. Then we send a message and it there's no change. So then we get AI to write five versions of it and it still doesn't work. And then we finally call the business up and the merchant says, it's a long weekend. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there's this tendency to... Uh, I think what AI shouldn't do is stop us from talking to our customers. Uh, you know, when you start, that's what I'm talking about. It was amazingly personalized, amazingly cohorted, very beautiful segmentation. We know who's transacting, who's not. Someone would have had a great feel saying that now I know from Friday to Sunday how to increase GMV and how to increase revenue. But, you know, uh, the beautiful thing about businesses like ours is that people tend to be very irrational and uh, I, I don't know which I would have told me are probably the person is on leave. They're not working, they're not running the business. I had a similar case when um, someone said I went off to study. So that's why I was not transacting. So, uh, you know, there are, there, are, there are these truly human fields, right? Now, what we tend to expect marketeers, agencies, everyone to do is sometimes that great communication moves uh, mountains, right? But I think it's so much more important to know the insight that creates the great communication. If we expect AI, if we expect anyone to be able to create great communication without knowing what that insight is, what that mover is, because of which this change will happen. Uh, and those insights are very human. Those insights don't come from data. Data tells you the what, the human tells you the why. And uh, I've often found that if we are great at doing the why, AI personalization, it helps us at doing the what much better. So the targeting can be much better, uh, the creative can be much better, the, uh, the, the number of examples of A-B tests we have can be much better, our landing page can be more personalized to say, hey, you're a small business in e-commerce versus you're a small business in education. But if you don't know the insight of why an education business is coming to mean at this point in time because it you know, the season is about to start. People are about to give their fees. So at this point in time, it is very important for us to ensure that we give them the best service. Um, you know, once once I had an example of, I, I there was no education season and uh, suddenly our fees, you know, our fees collection was going up and we found out that people are just uh, collecting, you know, those freshers, party fees and all of those. So if you don't have that insight, what can you do with a great line, a great message? So I think a real strong focus on the insight before you go to personalization absolutely, really helps. Absolutely, absolutely. agree with you on that. Um, so it, this feels like the same um, faster horses anecdote, right? Like uh, the only thing is Mr. Ford said, if you ask the consumers what they want, they will be faster horses. You ask AI yeah, what you want, it will say faster horses. So it, it's it's exactly that. So if we're inventing cars, like he said, it's not um, the same. So one of my um, colleagues, her name is Pooja Manik. She has this terrific talk called "Why AI Can't Get Angry," and how anger is an emotion that fuels most of the passion that exists in our line of work. Right. So. Uh, Plus one on all the, the the feelings part and everything. That's that's pretty much at the core of of, of all we do. Um, on the other hand, though, it, the, it kind of feels like <clears throat> this this can be misused as a good excuse to not upskill. Right? We are not some essential industry. Uh, we we we're not going to union, unionize anytime soon and like, you know <laughs> like tell each other that oh this is otherwise whatever we're, we're not so let's not get ahead of ourselves that we have wonderful jobs and ex extremely good careers unless we upskill 
um, mediocre people for generations have always been blaming something or the other for stealing their jobs. It used to be immigrants are stealing my jobs. Then when women entered the workforce, women are stealing my jobs. Now there's a new piece of tech and the tech is stealing my job, right? So let's not, so let's call out mediocre folks who are not willing to upskill as a cohort in themselves. And then <laughs> the, the, those of us who, who don't identify as part of that cohort, I think we'll enjoy learning it. Nice, those, lovely those point. Show AI ads only. <laughs> yes, yes. Personali personalize the content for them. <laughs> lovely. Thank you so much. Anything from you? I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think when you come into if you look at the state in which AI is right now and the kind of creatives that is, are being generated, uh, at best, what AI is doing is not replacing the talented who don't consider themselves in the the mediocre cohort. What it is doing is is giving you what 20 interns can do, right? Uh, but just because you can hire 200 interns doesn't mean that you're not going to have a head of creative or a head of uh, brand or marketing or design, right? Uh, and it, it it also plays to the nature of how even interns have changed over over a couple of decades. I was just remembered a story uh, on on this analysis paralysis in data that uh, how we begin to analyze data. It's very important to what you were saying of going back and speaking to the consumer and understanding what the insight is. The IKEA ad that we saw uh, in the morning, the LAMP ad, which is uh, uh, you know so regarded, uh, the, the ad production could have been done today by AI. But the insight of feeling bad for the old LAMP is not something that you will get from an AI because it doesn't understand what that feeling of, of uh, being attached to an inanimate, inanimate object is. Uh, the, the, the story that I was recalling was Harit Nagpal, the CEO of, of Tata Play, was talking about uh, an intern from one of the IMs who uh, was with Unilever and was stationed in Bombay, for those of you familiar with that. And uh, uh, what they'd done is they'd put these ice cream fridges in, in different retail outlets, across 70 different retail outlets, and he was looking after that region of, of those uh, uh, outlets. But sales, for whatever reason, were not going up, and you did whatever amount of performance marketing and point of sale purchase and all of that. Uh, and Harit asked him, saying, have you, have, you know, you're looking at 70 stores and have you gone, how many times have you gone to the store? And he said, I've, no, I've not been to the stores. I've been analyzing the point of sale data from all the stores. And he said, you go to the store and you'll see that the fridge that you've installed over there has got Vadilal ice cream in it, right? You're, what you have put in all the efforts is not going in because the distributors put in another brand on the store. Till you go to the store or you speak to the consumer and you understand where your rubber hits the road, uh, you can do any amount of personalization and PPC and, and whatever else, but some of it uh, is remembering that in this binary world that we are creating, the relationship between the brand and the consumer also has to be an empathetic individual relationship. And human insight is going to come from just observation of, of how people behave. That's not going away because the people who are spending the money is, is still not AI. It is still human beings trying to fulfill some innate need of theirs. Absolutely. There's absolutely no substitute for an interaction with your consumer directly, talking to your consumer, right? And AI yeah, can never do that for us. Thank you so much. Uh, now, I just want one last question before we go to my rapid fire. Uh, of course, I have no coffee hamper to give away, but we're still having the <laughs> rapid fire. Uh, where will you absolutely not use AI in your respective fields, in your respective industries? Giving feedback to team members. <laughs> it comes from heart, not from AI. No, you should. It's, it's so funny you say that because <clears throat> it's exactly the opposite in our thing. So um, uh, some of my colleagues ended up building um, a small bot that would mimic my feedback. <laughs> <laughs> was brilliantly That's done. very inventive. Uh, and I was like, hey, okay, if you want to kind of know what PG might think of this idea, here's the PG bot, so to speak, <laughs> right? And um, I think it was, it, was, it was actually pretty nice for the first one week. But, but what is it? Like, I mean, it was slightly basic level customized. Like, like it'll say macha at the end of every sentence. <laughs> okay, it'll be like, no macha, this doesn't work, that much. <laughs> so it can talk like you uh, a little it's bit. also animated. <laughs> Probably a little more, yeah, more exclamation marks at the end or whatever. So, um, I think those those kind of slightly fun experiments will keep will will kind of keep happening. But um, honestly, no surprises in in this uh, in this part. Um, I think creativity will absolutely continue to have the same dopamine moments 
uh, that it used to, pretty much. You will still feel like it is something that you came up with in your head every time you come up with something interesting and so on. The, but, but I think the way that we're um, able to execute is where most of the, um, the work is, is, is happening. Um, I, I, I honestly don't, I don't think our creative process overall has, like nothing has gone the opposite or nothing has been like completely removed in that way, no. I think you can use, at the stage at which AI is right now, and I recognize that this is going to get transformed in the next couple of years, maybe, maybe five. Um, you can use it for the what, the when, the where. Uh, the how and the why is a little more ambiguous. There's a number of entrepreneurs, and we're in Bangalore, right, in the room. Uh, the nature of disruption that they're trying to bring to their, their different industries is not something that is easily cooked up uh, by AI. So if you want to create a vision to have a dream. And the genesis of cyberpunk, for example, the, the movie Blade Runner, uh, the book actually, uh, which was written, it's called Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep? Uh, and it comes back to the same thing, right? An android doesn't have dreams. Uh, and so if you want to have a dream and pursue it, uh, that's something that you might be able to get inspiration from, uh, from AI and to say, come up with 10 concepts of dreams. But uh, to generate the dream and to have a pa passion to pursue that, is not something that you'd, you'd use AI for. And that Absolutely. goes in for, for motivating your employees or your consumers to work towards something also. It's not something that is easily rep replicable with yeah. artificial intelligence. It's an enabler, but yes, it can't replace. I think, for, I think for us, the most exciting, I don't think the creative process has changed. I think the why and how still remains the same. I think what's interesting actually is not what we can't do is what can we do tomorrow? Uh, I remember the early six uh, months of AI where every day there was a new tool coming and yesterday's tool closing down. Uh, it was super fun to see what can be done today. So, for example, I'm really excited about what AI calling can do. Uh, can AI hold a conversation for two minutes? Uh, can the conversation be intelligent enough to create just basic data? Can it interpret it to one more level to say this person probably needs this? For example, that's a great space, right? Because if you're able to do AI calling, then I don't know, I'm really irritated by those spam calls you get these days. Uh, maybe those can become better. Uh, so uh, I think it's, for me, it's a lot more about in the next one year, what can you see AI doing? That is what we could not do before. Like today, can I have a very, very intelligent conversation with my customer for two minutes and get a first level of data, not IVR calling, but just something that understands, interprets, and gives you the next line. For example, something that is very relevant in my industry would be, you know, we have long onboarding processes because there are so many things to be taken from the customer. And we deal with such a large, we deal with the biggest enterprise in India and someone who's starting up today. Uh, now, these onboarding forms, can, can AI act like a guide to them? Saying that, you know, uh, at this point in time, you need to do this. If you're in this category, then let me help you out. Uh, can it tell them what to use first? Uh, can, you know, and these were done. Now, either we had the tech or we had the creativity. We never had the power of AI merging the two to say that I can automate and I can create on the runtime. Nice. If we are able to merge the fact that data is coming in runtime and you are creating in runtime, right. uh, for very basic stuff also, you can create magical experiences. That would and be I powerful. think that would be amazing. Yes. Lovely. Okay. Uh, I think uh, strategies, that's one thing that uh, it's same way, same in the creative lines where you cannot do something that has to be important where we will not use AI at all. Okay, great. On to my rapid fire now. <laughs> this is your the front bench, okay. right? So it yeah. starts with you. If there's one thing and if AI was a genie, and if there was one thing that you would have AI do for you, anything, what would that be? You have 10 seconds. Uh, if one thing, AI, AI was there, it was genie, and I wanted... One wish. What would, what would you have AI do for you? Uh, just, I want to just be Mukesh Ambani's neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> Mukesh Ambani's neighbor. <laughs> Same question? Yeah, yeah. It's a long list. <laughs> Lucky, you have just 10 seconds. <laughs> Think, do something that I as a human can't do, lose weight. Yeah. <laughs> Lovely. No, fix the world, fix everything. That's 
fix everything <laughs> if it's that's one an version easy answer. That's, my, an easy. that's the that's that's the only i mean so because if i pick something but for that one wish it has to be a a full blown fix everything fix the environment fix people fix education fix roads fix everything he's not happy huh? as mukesh ambani's neighbor maybe you can put in a word <laughs> maybe you can collaborate <laughs> fix everything fix everything so that's i agree restart reset yeah. okay i'm just going to give you that no hamper for you but i'm just going to give it <laughs> With that, I'm going to wrap up this session. Thank you so much. It's been lovely chatting with you. Sharda, no, we have no, a question no. for you. No, for uh, guys, Sharda has been doing a bunch of things in her own shop with regards to AI, which she was she's told us about it before we got here. But Sharda, at least for a minute. Time's up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very quickly. So it's not my own shop. I work with Pink Lemonade Communications, and I have a couple of my colleagues here. So we've been doing a bunch of stuff uh, in the AI space when we first started. uh we created a bot for homely we created a virtual model for pink lemonade in fact we pitched the idea of a virtual modeling agency to a jewelry brand that we were working with we are currently working with a, a hospital brand where we are again talking to them and developing a bot for them so these are just some of the things that we have done uh, it's been a very very exciting journey for us lots of experimentations uh, when we first started on this so yes so that's really what we've done in this space thank you Thank <laughs> you.